Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome along to this afternoon's BCP plan planning committee. And I have to say how nice it is to see members of the public in back in the room. This is the first time we've had the public in here for a very, very long time. So welcome back to you. Uh, my name is Councillor Kelsey. I'll be chairing the meeting this afternoon. And we will firstly go over to Mr. Harrod, who will read out the housekeeping instructions. Mr. Harrod. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, all. Um, so just a couple of bits to go through. Please note that this meeting of the planning committee is being recorded by the council for live broadcast and will be published on the council's website for a minimum of six months. If you are seated in the front row of the public gallery, it is possible that the cameras will capture your image and by your presence, you are deemed to consent to be for use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. Please could everyone present follow these ground rules, which are only speak when invited to by the chairman. Please use the microphones on your desk when speaking and remember to turn them off when you're finished. If accessing the meeting via Microsoft Teams, please turn on your video function when invited to speak. Again, if you're accessing via Teams and would like to speak on an item, please do so by using the raise your hand feature in the bar at the top of the Teams window. When voting on a move, the chairman will call out each committee member's name in a roll call style and will ask each member to respond with a for, against or abstain vote. For those in the room, if the fire alarm sounds, please exit the building by way of the nearest available signed fire exit route and make your way to the ground floor of the multi-storey car park where officers will guide you to. Members of the public in attendance are asked not to disturb the meeting at any point and that in so doing, you may be asked to leave. Finally, please ensure that background noise is kept to a minimum and mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. And please note that this also includes members' laptops. Please turn off cameras and microphones and turn the volume all the way down to ensure that there's no disruption or feedback during the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I will now ask each person participating in this meeting to state their name and role, and I will run through in the order I I have here the staff. Myself, Councillor Kelsey, I'm Councillor for East Cliff and Spring and the Chairman of this meeting. Uh, Councillor Toby Johnson. Thank you. I'm Councillor Toby Johnson, Member for Alderney and Bourne Valley and Vice Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stephen Bar Barron. Councillor Steve Barron, Councillor for Parkstone Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stephen Bartlett. Uh, Steve Bartlett, Member for Redhill and North Bourne. Councillor Simon Bull. Councillor Simon Bull, Councillor for Winton East Ward. Councillor Malcolm Davies. Councillor Malcolm Davies, Member for East South Bond and Tupton. Councillor Brian Dion. Yeah, Brian Dion, Councillor uh, Penhill. Councillor George Farquhar. George Farquhar, I'm proud to represent Boscombe East and Pokestown. Councillor Peter Hall. Councillor Peter Hall for Christchurch Town Centre. Councillor Paul Hilliard. Paul Hilliard, Councillor for Muddyford, Stampit and West Highcliffe. Councillor Marion Le Pedivin. Marion Le Pedivin, Councillor for Newtown and Heatherlands. Councillor Simon McCormack. Burton Grange Ward. Councillor Tony O'Neill. Councillor Tony O'Neill, Councillor for Penhill Ward. And Councillor Anne Stribley. Anne Stribley, Parkston Ward Councillor. Thank you. Mr Hodges, please. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman. David Hodges, Team Leader, Development management. Good, Good afternoon, uh, Tom Hubbard, Senior Planning Officer. Mr Firth. Afternoon Chairman, uh, Robert Firth, Senior Solicitor. Thank you. And Mr Harold, you have already met. We also have other officers that are dealing in the background doing etc. I'll now move on to the agenda and the first item is apologies. Do we have any apologies please Mr Harold? No apologies have been received. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, which takes you to agenda item two. There are therefore no substitutes. Thank you, Mr. Harrod. Do we have any declarations of interest, please, from any members? I myself do have a declaration of interest as one of the people speaking on the first item is Stephen McLaughlin. And many of us will know him. He is ex-councillor Stephen McLaughlin. So anyone from the certainly from the Conservative Party will know him or would, would have had contact, so I'm declaring that just as a matter of transparency. Thank you, Councillor Davies. 
confirmation of minutes. Do the uh, <coughs> sorry. Do the committee agree to me signing the month? The um, sorry. I'll start again. Do you agree to me signing the minutes from the previous meetings? Thank you very much. I will do those. Right. Public issues. After each presentation that the officer has um, given, I will refer to Democratic Services to read out any written statements before we hear from any ward councillors. Moving on now to the schedule of planning applications. And the first application we have today is item 6A, which is the Bournemouth School. And I will now ask Mr Hubbard if he would prepare his screen to present the case, please. Mr Hubbard. Um, thank you, Chairman. Hopefully you can um, see on the we screen. Can. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Hear me OK. OK, um, so this application relates to Bournemouth School, which is located in East Way in Bournemouth. Um, the proposal is for the erection of fencing and gates. This shows the location in the context of the BCP area, um, as well as the site location plan. It's quite a large site, which, as I understand, it contains some freehold land owned by the school and also other areas which are leased from the council. I think these are mainly to the eastern area of the site. So this is an aerial photo of the site. You can see that the, the land which surrounds the school is mostly dense woodland known by the school as the copse. Um, this is covered by a woodland tree preservation order, which covers all the trees in this area. Um, the school own much of this area and use it for recreational purposes and to access um, sort of between the school and the playing fields and the sports pitches. These images show the school as you view it from East Way. So the COPS area, which is to be fenced, is sited mostly to the rear of these buildings. <clears throat> the school itself is recognised as an undesignated heritage asset as it's on the list of locally important buildings in Bournemouth. So it's, it's locally listed. Um, and then immediately to the west of the site on this bottom photo, there's a grade two listed church, St Francis of Assisi. So there are some heritage constraints to consider here. Um, there's been other extensions and alterations recently approved to the school and work has begun on those. This is a the site. Um, the fencing that you can see here is just temporary fencing for current construction work. The proposed gates and fencing will start beyond the rear of the building here at the side. There'll be a gate into the site and then the fencing along the boundary beyond that. The fencing doesn't run all the way to the front of the site with the adjoining the listed building so um, it won't have a detrimental impact on, on the setting of the church um, and it will also have very limited visibility from the street on this side and then this shows the opposite side of the street to the east again the fencing will be set well back from the street here and it won't enclose all of this woodland area so it won't be visible again from the street here <coughs> these images show some of the existing areas of fencing and enclosure within the site. There is a disused tennis courts which um, is next to the playing fields. This has got a tall chain link and barbed wire fence you can see here. Um, there's also within the woodland area a sort of old Nissan hut type building which is also fenced with chain link fence and barbed wire. And then behind the school itself there's also an existing green mesh type fencing. I don't know how clear it is in on your screen there, but um, it's very similar style of fencing to that which is proposed in this application. And then just a few more photos which show the existing boundary treatments around the edge of the site. Um, the rear of the COPS area backs onto residential properties in Charminster Road and Uplands Road, and there's a sort of variety of fences and walls um, at the rear of those properties. Uh, there's also some metal gates into the school grounds um, on the western side where the new gate is proposed and also at the back of the site. So this is the proposed site plan. Um, the proposal before you is for the installation of fencing and gates to en enclose quite a large part of the school's COPS area. 
Um, this is outlined in blue on this site plan here. Um, based on the existing boundary treatments around the back of the site and to the tennis courts and to the Nissan hut, actually the area of new enclosure is, is quite limited to um, this area on the eastern side of the site here, um, where there isn't any fencing at the moment. Um, the reason given for this work is for the safeguarding of pupils because it's used as a recreational area for pupils during break times and lunch times <clears throat> and also for access to the playing fields. Um, but at the moment it's also open and accessible to the public. Um, the applicants have provided a Dorset Police Safeguarding Report which refers to um, issues such as increasing antisocial behaviour in this area such as drug taking and drug dealing for example um, but there's also plenty of sort of innocent um, behaviour by members of the public such as you know dog walking that sort of thing. Um, there has been significant local objection to the proposal and the vast majority of the public objections relate to this loss of access to the area by members of the public who use it for dog walking and other recreational uses. Um, the school state however that the land which they're proposing to fence is within their freehold ownership. I understand there's no um, recorded public right of way or no claim has been made for one. Um, it's very common for school grounds to be enclosed by fencing for security and in this case it doesn't include all of the woodland area. You can see this hatched area on the plan here is a is the leased part of the site rather than the freehold owned part of the site so that area will still be accessible to the public as will the the um, playing fields beyond. <clears throat> in terms of the impact on the character of the area and on the locally listed building, the fencing will be set well back from the street frontage on both sides. You can see here set behind the building line and over here within the woodland area. Um, so it won't be readily visible from the road. <clears throat> A sort of fine mesh design so it'll be a quite a lightweight and permeable um, feature. It will be painted green to blend in with the, the surroundings. It's a common type of fencing used in many schools in the area. It's a little tall at 2.4 meters high but it in terms of the scale of the buildings it's considered appropriate and it won't be visible from the street um, and it needs to be relatively tall anyway to have the, the be security benefits desired. <coughs> Um, and then this shows the gate design, which is also in the same style as the fencing. It's slightly sort of industrial in appearance, but it, again, it's a common design for schools. Um, they'll also provide a more uniform design of gate. At the moment, there's a bit of a mismatch with, with the designs across the site. Um, trees are obviously an important consideration here. A tree report and method statement has been submitted with the application and a tree officer has inspected this and raised no objections or concerns. The proposed fencing will be in the root protection areas of, of some trees, but the fence posts will be relatively well spaced and they will have a limited impact on roots. They'll use a sort of special methodology such as caretaking, hand digging holes to avoid roots, for example. Um, and there's only one small group of trees to be removed, which I've shown here. Um, these are considered to be low quality trees, which are growing close to the rear of the school building. Um, there was no objection by the tree officer to, to the loss of these. Um, the only other issue raised by objectors in terms of the impact on wildlife and ecological concerns has been considered. <clears throat> but the fencing is largely located where there are um, existing fences around the boundary of the site um, and gates are replaced in similar locations to existing so no trees are being apart from that small group of trees there's very limited habitat loss it won't really um, have a significant impact Tom, in this regard. Really. Tom can you stop talking please because you the link in, a, in the room is broken down so from when you started on the trees, we've not been able to hear you since then. So if you could just whilst we get rebooted in here. OK, sorry. Yeah, thanks. I'll let you know when we when we're ready.
Are you there, Tom? Yes, 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 I'm here. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. There's a the hub here fell out of the system. So if you could start again from where you started talking about the trees, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Can you still see the presentation on the on the screen? Yes, I can, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was saying trees are obviously an important consideration given the, the woodland TPO status. Um, we've had a tree report and method statement um, submitted to us. The tree officer is happy with that and hasn't raised any objections or concerns. Um, obviously the fencing will be close to and within the root protection areas of um, quite a few trees, but the fence posts will be well spaced and they won't have a significant impact on the roots because they are planning on um, sort of hand digging holes to um, avoid roots and uh, basically taking care with, with the excavations. Um, there's only one small group of trees which are to be removed, which is those shown on the screen here. Um, but they're considered to be low quality trees, which aren't of any significance. Um, and they're also growing very close to the rear of the, the school site itself. Um, and the only other issue I commented on was that some wildlife and ecological concerns have been raised, um, but the fencing largely is located where there are existing fences um, and gates. Um, few trees are being removed, just those ones are, are pointed out here. So there's limited habitat loss and overall the impact is considered acceptable in that regard. Um, so overall, just to, to summarise, the, the fencing wouldn't have a harmful impact on the character of the area. Um, it wouldn't have an impact on the, the heritage assets. It would be acceptable in terms of the tree impacts and the ecological impact. And therefore it's been recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr Hubbard. <coughs> Just before I ask Mr. Harris to read out the presentation, I'll just confirm that Ruby came around to show us her laptop earlier on just for transparency, is that she had received an email, as I think all members of the planning board just have, it's probably just come in with regards to an application this afternoon, but she was just showing me for clarity's sake that she had received that about it. So it's just purely to let you know for transparency reasons. Mr. Harris. Yes, thank you, and so the presentations uh, on the right of uh, If I start with the first objector, which is Mary Hurst, and she writes, I have the original deeds to 75 Upland Road dating back to 1925, long before the school was built or planned in 1939. My family have lived in this property since then, so know the history of the residents have used this right of easement slash historic public right of way and civic amenities since that day and long before without interruption. Feds in the whole with denying access to the public and preventing residents access through their gates in use since the 1920s and 30s is contrary to civic amenity rights allowing spaces available for peaceful public use since that time. It's gates to the properties have been sent and are not new as suggested by the school. The school only used the woods during term time and weekdays, and then just for a couple of hours a day, denying the public right to access and enjoy the civic amenity throughout the whole year. The schooling grounds are already fenced off for security. The ancient oak woods are important to the community as a nature reserve, conservation area, and also particularly important to those in the local community without gardens, who live in flats or without cars to travel further afield. They're also used by local scouting groups who say they already access the church access and other public access previously used has been blocked without warning. The proposed plan is completely contrary to both our local council and the government's drive to protect green spaces for public use to aid physical and mental health. Residents do not dump their litter in the woods. We alert the school when through a large opening during the holidays and leaving rubbish in the woods. 1997-98 particularly, is now stopped by post and a gate. There is a large safe playing field available for pupils used during lunch hours, which would require only two teachers to supervise. Supervision of pupils in the woods for safeguarding purposes would need more staff 
even if public access stops. Well, the council gave the Lantern School in 2009 no sign about the woods being private or trespassing warning appeared and no notification to the residents that it now belonged to the school and our rights would be affected. There are, there are, however, still signs indicating use for the public date of 1991. We've been informed the details of all the plans related to are lost, therefore not available on either Bournemouth Planning Office or the Dorchester Council Records Planning Office, so no one can confirm what covenants or arrangements were laid down. It's been in public use throughout. Uh, that's the end of that statement. So moving on to the next one is from a Mr. Stephen McLaughlin, and he writes: Bournemouth School has an excellent reputation of which the which the town can be proud. Its contribution to the local community fundraising is recognised and appreciated. Regarding the application, the planning committee is asked to reject it on the following grounds: one, contrary to planning policies. The proposal is contrary to objective one of the Bournemouth Local Plan Course Threshold and Policy CS12 pertaining community uses. Policy CS30 promoting green infrastructure and Policy CS31 recreation play and sports. The proposal would end the established custom and practice of shared use of the whole cops and significantly reduce its amenity value to the public. Two, no demonstrable needs. Bournemouth Schools consultant Kendall Kingscott referred to Regulation 25 of Part 5 of Education Independent School Standards England Regulations 2014 in their application to the DfE. This regulation states that in this paragraph is met if the proprietor ensures that the school premises and the accommodation and facilities provided therein are maintained to, to a standard such that, so far as is reasonably the health, safety and welfare of pupils are ensured. However, this fencing does not comply with the DfE's output specification, Technical Annex 2B. In particular, the proposal does not satisfy any of the following. Must allow full disabled access, should include diverse services including grass, should have a gradient to allow for maintenance, planting, e.g. trees, shall not facilitate the scaling of fences. In addition, the Ofsted report for Bournemouth School, page five, specifically refers to safety and states that students know the factors that promote safety and act on them, promoting the school as a very safe environment. Students, parents and carers all report that the school is a safe place. Alternative ways of providing high quality, inclusive, safe and secure space for pupils existing fence areas such as the tennis courts would not interfere with the existing access to the cops. Three, adverse impact on ecology. The proposed fence would interfere with the known corridor for local wildlife through, throughout the cops, badgers and foxes. Given the density of the existing deciduous native trees <coughs> and oaks, it is highly likely that tree roots would adversely be affected by Evacuations for uh, sorry, excavations for fence posts. Four, restricting community use of green infrastructure. BCP Council's draft GIS natural assets and protects wildlife habitats and green spaces for outdoor mindfulness in urban areas. Restricting public access to the cops would be contrary to the policy objectives of BCPS and Bournemouth Core Strategy Policy CS30, promoting green infrastructure. The Planning Committee is requested to reject this application on planning grounds and thereby safeguarding the humanity and ecological value of the COPs for future generations. At the end of that statement, uh, which takes us to uh, Mike Jones, who is um, writing support, and he writes, Dear sirs, the school is faced with either to fence the area as proposed or to discontinue its use, depriving pupils of outdoor space in which to exercise, play and relax. There are a number of issues with which the school has to contend. Members of the public, including dog walkers, accessing the area during the school day at times 
when students are moving through the cops from the main site to the playing fields, or are simply <coughs> in the outdoor space at break or lunchtime. Dog walkers failing to remove feces despite the provision of a bin adjacent to the east wall. <coughs> Fly shipping as a regular occurrence, even though we have installed posts to prevent vehicles accessing the cops. Individuals hanging around at the rear of the school and cops on early evenings and weekends, leaving behind broken bottles, empty beer, paraphernalia. Access from neighbours in Uplands Road who have installed gates onto the cops. It is interesting to note that so protective are some of our neighbours <coughs> that they have used bar along the boundary and yet they feel it their right to have unrestricted access to the school's freehold lands. Garden waste deposited in the cops from neighbouring properties through the aforementioned gates which have been removed by the school as part of our woodland management plan. <coughs> the school are simply seeking to ensure that all its students and staff are safe and there is sadly no way of doing this without fencing in the cops. This measure proposal provides a secure route for students between the main site and the playing fields. If implemented, the public will retain access to an area of the cops from East Way. This area is BCP freehold, but it's leased to the school. The school has not applied to erect a fence along East Way, even though this would have been preferable from the school's perspective, so that the public could continue to enjoy a significant portion of the cops. The committee should also be mindful that there are a number of large open spaces for the public to enjoy nearby, including the Dragon Park. We hope the planning committee will accept the advice of its officers and approve the application. Thank you, Mr. Harrod. We have no board councillors have registered to speak at this. I will now open up to board members. Is there anyone that would like to kick off on this one, please? Councillor here. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, a few questions, please, for the officer. First of all, on, on the plan, there is a the unused tennis court. It says something about there's a build project. Please, could the officer confirm what the plans are for that tennis court? Similarly, I, I understand, obviously, that from what we've heard, students cross the court, cops, to get to the playing field. Uh, is, is that to continue? Because I can see that there was gate that way. Maybe I was missed that. And then similarly, what? So at the moment, there's been no claims for a right of way. So we we could be approving it on the basis no claims for right of way. But what what would happen if a claim came along? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, wasn't um, the officer for the recent planning application but I've, I've had a quick look and i understand that the, there's no building work to be undertaken on the tennis courts area it's actually going to be removed and restored um to more of a woodland setting to complement the rest of the cops area the building work is mainly around the rear of the school in this area here so perhaps they were taking away a bit of the green space and, and replacing it over there um, that's that's how I understand it anyway. Um, do the do the students cross the cops to get to the playing fields? Um, yes, in in the information that the school have provided, it, it appears that that is the case. Yes. Um, in terms of the right of way issue, well, I think we need to determine it based on um, the information that we've got at the moment, which is that there is no public right of way. Um, to this area. If something happens in the future, then it would probably be for the, the school to deal with to, to provide that, that access. Um, it's my view that it, it wouldn't affect the planning application before us today.
repeat it, we'll watch straight in a second. Thank you, Tom. I'm sorry that you had to uh, ramble on as I did um, with the. Uh, um, my questions are, are fairly simple. Um, you might not be able to answer more, but it helps paint a picture as regards the uh, nature of um, what we're talking about here. My first question would be: What's the age range of the uh, the pupils at school? My question would be: You mentioned the report from the police as regards increased uh, ASB uh, disorder. Um, my second question would be, has there been any assault or any safeguarding issues recorded with the police um, from this school? Um, my original question was, the playing fields which are referred to repeatedly in the presentation, what is the practice at the moment crossing to crossing to those playing fields? Are they and are they currently fenced? By practice, what I mean is, uh, are, are, is this a structured Activity by the school, e.g., uh, rugby practice or something like that, leaving the school grounds so that they can, uh, I don't know, uh, take a break at lunchtime. And my uh, the question for the number of trees which are actually being um, felled, I believe, was the term because you're hand digging holes to protect tree roots, but there's going to be trees in the photo which, uh, which were indicated. What is the exact number of those trees, and is there anything in the proposal for those trees to actually be replaced? And my last question is relating to the leased area. Um, the leased area and the freehold area was mentioned on occasion during the presentation. Could the officer define what is the freehold area and what is the leasehold area? Because on the plan on 27, it seems to be within the facility, within the area which is proposed to be fenced but not within the actual area which is fenced already for the buildings of the school. Um, and my final one in my page here, who actually still owns that lease? Uh, sorry, who actually owns the freehold pre and who actually um, is deciding on the lease of the area of the Thank you, Chairman. Um, OK, working through those questions, the the age range of um, pupils in the school, it's, it's a secondary school, so uh, ages 11 to 18. Um, the playing fields are used for both. They're used for recreational purposes during lunch times and break times, and they're also used for sporting activities. There are playing pitches there, there's tennis courts. Um, the fields are shared with all the school for girls, I believe, and there's also there is a public right of way to those those fields, but that's still accessible through the cops area, and it's still accessible from Eastway itself. Um, 
the question about the leasehold and the freehold areas, well, I haven't seen um, land registry documents to, to show the exact area, so I'm um, trusting the schools, but they say that the, the area they're fencing is their freehold area and that the hatched area on the plan there is, is the leased area. Um, they say it's leased from the council, um, but I haven't seen any document documentation relating to that. Um, so I, I didn't quite get the question about the, the Dorset Police safeguarding, if you wouldn't mind just repeating that one, please. Well, Major. Yep, please do. Yes, you, you mentioned a report um, from the Dorset Police as regards increased antisocial behaviour involving drinking and disorder. What my question was, was there any reports of safeguarding issues relating to pupils such as assault or uh, interference by drug dealing or anything which is actually being recorded with the police as a safeguarding issue for the pupils of that particular school? Um, no, I haven't seen any sort of record of any sort of actual crimes or, or um, anything to that extent. I think it's more sort of low level antisocial behaviour concerns um, and safeguarding concerns about mixing pupils in this area and members of the public when it isn't particularly well overlooked um, in that respect. Um, and I think the final question was about the numbers of trees. Um, I'm just checking the plan here. The, the photo that I showed you, there are six trees to be felled. They're all category C trees, which means they're sort of limited lifespan. Well, could you just hold on a sec, please? Sure, yeah. I have a fairly good shot on any microphone of that screen. <laughs> Okay, sorry, Tom, can you carry on again now, please? Thank you, yeah. Um, so the, the trees, there's six trees to be lost. Five of these trees are um, C category trees, which are sort of poor quality, limited lifespan. One is a category B tree, um, but again, they're, they're all growing very close to, to the building. So the tree officer was not concerned about um, the loss of those trees. There isn't any proposed replacement trees, um, but again, the, the tree officer hasn't stipulated that as a requirement. I mean, it's, it's a dense woodland area. Um, trees sort of in that context kind of grow. Um, they're sort of self-seeded sort of woodland trees, really. So there, there wasn't a specific need to replace that in terms of amenity value or anything like that. Tom, you're back again. We keep losing you. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, so have you finished <coughs> responding, Tom? Yeah, I don't know. So I don't know if you heard all of that. Or then we heard the majority of it, yes. Yeah. So I will move on. Just before we move on, I'll just um, remind the Council of Park with this question with regards to the leases, that that is actually not for us to consider. It's not planning consideration. So we, we have no say over any of that anyway. So moving on, Councillor Stribley. Um, a number of my questions have, have been asked one way or another. Um, I'm concerned about the uh, trees being removed. I accept very good specimens, but that is the nature of woodland. Woodland is, by nature, self-seeded. Most of the trees are not particularly good specimens until they attain such an age. So I am somewhat concerned that there are no proposals for additional trees on the site or as far as I know, other environmental uh, improvements. <coughs> um, we, we've heard concerns about antisocial behaviour as, as a reason for requiring this fencing. 
but we've not been actually given any evidence <coughs> whatsoever, and we've been told that school is a very safe school, as I believe it is, and it has an extremely um, good... Uh, so without any evidence of untoward behaviour, I suppose <coughs> that is something that, again, is not relevant to the planning issue. The question is, we are being asked if we can put fencing in here. Well, I can't think of many reasons why not. I equally can't think of many reasons why we should go in there either. So I, I feel uh, somewhat of a disadvantage on this application. Uh, if the land has been open to public use, unchallenged, I think my memory serves me right up from elsewhere. The term was 16 years for some odd reason. Uh, but then the land, in effect, remains public. And so I, I, have, I feel very diffident about this application altogether, Chairman, and I, I have concerns. Thank you, Councillor. Ms. Potter, is there anything you wanted to come back on? I will just remind people, of course, the fencing they want to put up is 2.4 metres high. Under permitted development rights, they do not need to come to us because they could put a two metre fence up yeah. at any time because it is on their land. Mr. Hubbard? Two metres would differ to most people, you'd say. Mr. Hubbard, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I was actually going to raise the same, same point, um, actually. Um, Yes, I mean, if, if the land is in their ownership, they can put up a fence up to two metres in height on this land without requiring planning permission. It's, it's only really required planning permission because it's um, above that 2.4 metre height. OK, thank you. Councillor Hall. Thank you very much. I've listened to some of the debate here, but I still think um, safe guiding pupils is paramount. Um, the proposed fencing is appropriate, um, and I'd be very happy to support approval. Thank you, Chairman. Are you making a move to that effect, Councillor? Yes, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to propose that set out. Thank you. Um, I do have other speakers lined up to speak. Do I have a second of that move before I go to that, Councillor O'Neill? Would you like to speak now, Councillor O'Neill? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, similar, similar to. Councillor Hall, uh, I think there is merit in putting a higher fence around. They have a perfect right to put a two metre fence. I think the requested fence makes good sense, recognising that it is a school. Uh, and as many will be aware, um, schools do attract degrees of antisocial behaviour. Uh, I think you're right that this could be offered that protection. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Uh, Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm really troubled by this application in some respects because of the weight of public um, concern in the area. You know, and I think the report says there were about 117 objections uh, with only 28 support. And given that you know, the public have had access to this wood for 100 years, it's not surprising that they're now objecting that for some will suddenly become less safe than it's always been. So there's a bit of a conflict, particularly as there's already a fence at the rear of the school, but it's halfway through the, the cops. It doesn't extend down to the playing field. So, you know, one has to question security, you know, whether, and, and having looked at the fence, it's in a very poor condition. It doesn't look as if it any main school. Um, but I think uh, understanding the issue about community development, uh, I understand it completely. So it comes down to, I guess, a point about what the school is entitled to do legally. And I know we're not here to, to question the legal aspects of it, but actually when you sign the form, you do sign on that application that you are entitled to, um, you know, make the application as landowner, demonstrate you might have got another 11 years lease or uh, lease, lease ownership of the land. And, and I'm intrigued somehow because I wondered if, in fact, Corner School was a legal entity, is that right? And I assume it must be. Because, um, if the land has been given to them 
by the council, they must be a legal entity and, and own it, right, which is most unusual actually for school premises. Um, so, you know, in, in a legal sense, um, I guess if that's what they're entitled to do, they're entitled to do it. Right, so the residents of actually would be established in any rights of way that may, may, may exist. And I'm a bit troubled that when the land was donated to the school in 2009, there are no associated documentation, so we don't actually know what was agreed at the time. Um, you know, did it say under no circumstances are the public allowed to cross it, or what is it? They should they should always be allowed to cross it. it you know, it, it, it really is a big question. And given the length of time that it have been using it, it really is a, a very odd situation. So. In, in, in planning terms, what concerns them have got? Um, there's been a lot of talk about the ecology of the land, in particular, badges have been mentioned, and uh, on the basis of the numbers of different types of wildlife that is apparently using, if an ecology assessment has been done on the land, uh, and what impact this additional fence would have on on the um on the wildlife there and so if there's any negative aspects of it um so that that's one point i had the other the other point uh, i thought i one of us all with the um yeah with this contradiction between local so one would have thought there would have been a mechanism to actually have a compromise somehow and the school is saying going into the in, in, into the area during school hours but what about out, outside school hours is there not a way that the school and the local residents could have come to some kind of agreement where access was granted outside of school hours you know it seems to be a fairly simple sort of compromise that could be made it doesn't seem to be any effort what to, to do and i think it's a great shame that you know i think it's a great shame that more councillors aren't here to actually reflect on local residents are saying uh, because it would their views on this I think would be quite important and so I, I, I guess that's all of that when it comes down to the planning issues what is the ecology has there been an ecology assessment done which I think they probably ought to have done that's the question thank you thanks councillor Mr Hubbard thank you chairman no I don't think there is an ecology assessment on this application um, apart from those sort of five small trees, there's no um, habitat loss. I guess the main concern would be, um, you know, fencing off access to the area. Um, but again, if you look at the site plan, most of the area is already enclosed by walls and fences around the boundary. It's only really this area here. And again, it comes back to that issue that they could um, put up a fence to enclose this area without any planning permission in any in any case. Okay. Uh, Chairman, one question, sorry, sorry, one question I meant to ask before is about badgers. I believe they're not a protected species, but badgers, when they have a regular route, will not change that regular route. Uh, a few years ago, there was a fascinating program about a new development several hundred properties which had crossed uh, Badger Route and Badgers used to cross the garden, walk through the sitting room and out of the front door of a number of the properties because that was the room and they continued to do so, so long as the residents would open the door for them. Um, I would hate to think though that we actually had Badgers or any other creatures fenced off into an area where they could not escape from or, or find their normal foraging routes. So perhaps if we could be reassured about that. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of um, what badgers are sort of using or accessing the site. Um, again, we haven't got the ecology report, so I, I can't really comment on that in, in detail at the moment. Um, whether you think it, it will require an assessment um, prior to sort of installation of the fencing to, to ensure that any, there's any mitigation that's 
required might be possible, but again, it comes back to the fact that they can they can put a fence up within this site without without planning permission. Um, in any case, so it's, it's a bit tri tricky as to whether that would be reasonable. Thanks, Mr. Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm it's more of a technical question um, uh, on, on the application. Uh, at the beginning, was a certificate A or a certificate B applied for on application? Because if looking at the plans, it looks as if the red line on application is around the entire site, when actually there should be a red line around the freehold area that the school owned and a blue area around the bit that the council freehold, whether a certificate A or a certificate B. Thank you. Um, I'm just checking that. Uh, yes, they've submitted the application under a certificate A. Um, so they've declared that they um, own the site. I mean, they have a a freehold and a lease of interest um, in the site. Would that not be incorrect? If the council own the freehold of that part of the site, then technically, I think yes, possibly that that is correct. Yeah. Then that's quite an issue on a technical matter, isn't it? We're not really sure if we can decide this today based on what's in front of us today. Because that's a that's a quite significant issue. Yes, I mean they 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 signed the form again. We accept it in good faith at the time. If new information comes to light later on, then it can um, affect the uh, validity of the application. I have to look into that. Yeah. I'll come back to that. Councillor Dion. Yeah, chair. I just had the one. Question. Since they have the right to put a uh, a six foot fence or a two meter fence up, is there a uh, explanation why they need the extended height to uh, two point four? Yep. Mr. Tobin. Um. No, we don't have we don't have an explanation um, as to to the additional height. It's it's the application that's been put to us. Um. So it just needs to be assessed. <laughs> Relevant impacts, such as the impact on the, the character of the area and, and other material considerations. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Burst, I wonder if I could ask you to um, come into the meeting, please. If you could possibly answer the question from Councillor McCormack with regards to application form A and B. Sorry, Chairman, did you say call me there? I did indeed, Mr. Berth, yeah. Councillor Sorry. McCormick raised the point about application form A. I just wondered whether you right. would comment on that, please. Oh, I missed the question, Chairman. I was, uh, I was actually looking up a question re regarding badges because uh, actually I believe badges do have some protection under the law, but not necessarily protection via the EU directive. So I was checking that point. But um, could, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, Councillor McCormack, would you like to repeat your question, please? On application, um, if you own the site outright, then you would supply A. Sorry, I'm then it, on application, if you didn't own the entire site, you released hold of part of it, and there was a third party freeholder, you would supply a certificate B. And in this case, it seems like the applicant should have been and not certificate A, and that's a significant legal issue if I'm correct. Uh, Ch Chairman, I mean, I don't know the facts, so it's quite hard for me to give a definitive answer to this. I mean, generally speaking, it is correct to say, obviously, that a person should complete the correct certificate because the certificate relates to the notifications that they should give to um, the owners prior to an application being submitted. Um, I said it, I can't really comment whether they should have done certificate A or certificate B because I don't know the facts of the case. Um, but clearly, if there's an issue, it would have to be looked into. 
Thank you, Mr. First. In fact, I have a response here from Mr. Hodges, which clearly states that the validity of the application is only affected in the light of a legal challenge. The other party who appears to have an interest in this case in the land is BCP, and we are naturally aware of the proposals. So it would only come to light if there were a legal challenge. Chairman, I'm also that's Sorry, Chairman, that's not strictly correct, I don't think. I, I think if we're on notice of an issue, it's something we would have to look into. But um, as I said, if, if we're the only other owners, then that clearly is going to be relevant to us considering whether we're on notice or not. Um, so it's something I think we could pick up separately to this uh, outside this particular meeting. Yeah, I think from a legal point of view, if we made a decision on this and then it was deemed afterwards, then the application could just get the refusal notice. Yeah, yeah, Chairman, we'd have to look into it. Yeah, thanks, Mr. First. Councillor Barton. There's a question on the height. I understand it's the Department for Education. Yeah, it's a stipulation by the standard 2.4. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Councillor Ball. Thank you, Chair. Most of the things I actually want to talk about happening, so I know which is handy. Um, obviously, the right of way is an issue that. What you said, we can't address it, we can't look at it. Um, but I think I made questions afterwards. I'm interested in the rights of badges that uh, Mr. Firth briefly alluded to and whether any mitigation was considering continuing access from foxes and badges, uh, as well as members of the public outside of school time. Obviously, basically, in school time can't be prevented. I was going to be reading for I was going to say, let's wearing watches. I'm sure the badgers won't know what the time there is, but. They are I'm nocturnal sure, creatures. I'm sure that that would be something that can be looked at outside, but at the moment there's been no ecological report put in. So, no, anyway, no, that's possible. But, uh, well, you would need to either refuse the application or put it in as a condition. But as, as they could just put two metre fence in, they said it was to go down that route. Yeah, no, I'd like to see it as a condition. Yes. Um, we can ask for it as a condition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go back now to the move. We have a move by Councillor uh, to, move, to move it and from Councillor O'Neill to second that move. If I call your names one by one, if you could all indicate whether you are for or against that move, please. Sorry, Councilor. Chairman, is that subject to a, an additional We'll condition? ask for the condition for the... Um, Ecological report to be added. Mr. Hubbard, are you okay with that? Yes, I, th I think that would be possible, yeah. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Barron. Councillor Bartlett. Yes. Councillor Bull. Yes. For. Councillor Dion. Or. Councillor Farquhar. Against, and I'd like my name recorded for the next question. Councillor Hall. For. Councillor Hilliard. For. Councillor Lefebvre. For. Uh, Councillor McCormick. Against. Councillor O'Neill. For. Uh, Councillor Stribling. Against. Councillor Johnson. For. And myself, Councillor Kelsey, I am also for. Mr. Harrod, could we have the numbers, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I have nine for, and I have five against. Thank you, Mr. Harrod. Therefore, that application is granted, subject to the condition of an ecological report being submitted before that is actually passed over. So thank you very much. Thank you for the residents and the people that have taken the time to object or support that application. Move on to the second application this afternoon. And that is for Kingsgate House at 7 the Avenue. And I will ask David Hodges to share his screen with the application, please, Mr Hodges. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, hopefully you're seeing the presentation now and hearing me OK. We can indeed. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so this is a proposal 
uh, for Kingsgate House at 70 Avenue in Poole um, to make alterations and additions to an additional dwelling, uh, falling a new flat roof of the parapet um, and uh, balconies to front elevation and to re-render the property. So in terms of location, uh, the avenue, uh, you've got the LV roundabout up here, the avenue coming down here. The property is actually set off um, the avenue and uh, set back into the site um, and is closer actually to the uh, Christchurch on the Allamhurst Road on this side, close to the old uh, former boundary between the two uh, Poole and Bournemouth authorities. Um, just to show you, it's a slightly uh, untypical uh, sort of location that you've got. Uh, with the property uh, close to its northern boundary, access through the avenue uh, on the right of way from Kingsgate, uh, with another property to the south of Aurora, um, and then you can see the church on the uh, to the east there. Uh, so just looking at the view, this just shows you the um, extent to which um, the property is sort of tucked in. Um, in this area here between these uh, flats and other buildings, you can see the trees on the site. Uh, the property is just here. Uh, where you can see it's existing sort of hip roof and there uh, an existing terrace um, and this is the other property just to the south of Aurora uh, which is largely blank uh, facade on its northern side uh, but you can see so garage blocks uh, to the box flat and then the church hall uh, and the church just there uh, so uh, as you see from the report chairman there's an extant consent um, to significantly enlarge the property um, which consists of making it into a three-story dwelling so th these are the plans on the top um, which would have created this second floor and then an approved terrace on here um, and then a flat roof area to the north which is restricted in its use um, under a planning condition uh, so current proposal is down here so in effect uh, the bulk of mass at second floor is unchanged. Um, the proposal, this is in effect sort of a vaulted area above the uh, first floor, um, excuse me, um, it doesn't include accommodation and then this remaining area around is shown as a, uh, a fairly large and uh, slightly unusual uh, roof garden uh, or terrace at the top. What that means in terms of uh, the plan, so this is a previous application where you would have had a full uh, second uh, second story, second floor up here. Um, and then uh, with the current proposal, you can see there's less sort of bulk in this view, slightly greater bulk in this view, but set in uh, on the roof. Uh, and then on the other side, so in effect, what would uh, best described as the front for the south elevation, uh, you would have this true uh, second floor here, um, whereas now you've got this roof terrace and this sort of central section. Um, proposed. Um, you've seen in the report lots of references to uh, issues of privacy, um, just to give you some uh, measure of the distances from the property here, so 33 metres and then 36 metres, um, in order to give members a, a, a comparison. Um, the recently issued uh, national De design guidance uh, talks about uh, window to window distances between habitable rooms of between 15 and 20 metres. Um, so you'll be able to see that uh, in terms of any issues of direct overlooking, uh, we're comfortably within any of those standards in the um, national design guidance, for example. Um, and just as you've seen from the aerial photos, a uh, number of mature trees uh, within the site. Um, the uh, my understanding of the scheme is that in the fact it doesn't affect the footprint. Um, so in effect, uh, it's not bringing the actual dwelling any closer to the uh, tree rooting zones um, actually at ground floor level, but obviously raising up the height uh, slightly so it would be closer to these trees on the northern boundary. Um, just to give you some idea of the site views at the moment. So this is south elevation. So you've got these existing terraces here. Um, the building is built up on this area here. Um, uh, the building you see on the right in this view is part of the uh, Christchurch Church Hall. Um, and you can see these existing terraces and balconies that you have uh, on the property. Uh, and then looking back, this is um, looking north towards the northern boundary down the side of the house. And just to zoom in, you can, just, you can see the uh, uh, block flats uh, to the north in the uh, gap between the trees on this view here. Um, and then just on the right, this is the lower uh, part of the um, uh, Christchurch Church Hall. 
um, uh, where I, as I say, I understand from the um, description and in the report that uh, these are sort of partly obscure glazed windows, uh, which were done put in originally in order to ensure privacy between the two uh, properties. Um, so, Chairman, you see that we've looked uh, carefully at um, the merits of the scheme. Uh, the applicant does have a fallback position to uh, to construct something larger, um, and we satisfied in this instance that uh, the application uh, is acceptable under under the policies in the pool local plan, and therefore is recommended for approval to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Howard. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this first one is from um, Clifford Carvel, and he writes, "Dear sirs, I'm writing as a director of Headingley Management Company Limited." On behalf of Headingley, the block of apartments which in Headingley we have 41 residents with an average age of 75 plus. Because of the absence of balconies at Headingley, they regularly use the communal patio immediately north of Kingsgate House in order to enjoy the sun and fresh air. The directors have consulted the majority of them about this redevelopment of the cottage proposed under the above application. Your members of the planning officer will have read the letters from our residents, which have been summarised by your officers. We strongly object to this development because it is selfishly one sided. The losers are the many, the occupants of numbers five and seven, the avenue. We will be brief and strong concerns over the invasion of privacy and the potential damage to Scotland's clients. Thank you. Thanks. And with that statement, the next one is from Stuart Graves, and he writes, as secretary of the parochial church council of Christ Church Westbourne, CCW, I wish to present my reasons for objecting to the development as proposed. CCW to the east of Kingsgate House and currently the privacy of occupants of both properties is assured with the windows of the upper floors of CCW's hall having obscured glazing and Kingsgate House having no windows that overlook CCW. So if approved, it will result in no using the roof terrace looking into the patio area and ground floor of the hall with the result that privacy will be lost. The current hall which replaced an earlier hall is well used by members, families and visitors to CCW. The use predates the redevelopment of the cottage to become Kingsgate House. It is considered that loss of privacy is a significant planning issue come in this instance if the walls of the roof terrace were, in high, were increased in height to 1.8 meters elevations where overlooking would be an issue. The council would need to consider whether the mass and adverse impact on the visual amenity would be acceptable. And so moving on to the statement and supports on behalf of the applicants. They write, um, our client's permission to APP 19-00590F dated 27th of November 2019 for alterations to the existing dwelling and to add second story with new flat roof raised roof Height, insert double glazed patio doors and windows, and new glazed Juliet balconies to front elevation changes and changes to finishing materials. Due to covenant restrictions on the height of the building, our, my, our client was unable to invoke the approval. We have therefore submitted a revised design, APP 21008073F, to the subject of this application for alterations and additions and perform new flat roof with parapet, insert patio doors and windows with new Juliet balconies to front elevation, provide render finish to walls. We note the comments concerning the north elevation and have noted on drawing 5991-23, the north wall to remain as brickwork and the new walling to this elevation to match the existing and the render treatment applies to the east south winds. The building of the new brickwork so the north elevation will have to be built by overhang construction from Kingsgate House due to the close proximity of the boundary. 
If the application is granted, we assume it will be subject to similar to that on approval APP 9 of 1900590 and trees which included an arbicultural method statement and details of required facilitation and pruning prior to the commencement of the development. We hope this statement will help clarify our client's application. Thank you. And finally, I have a statement from uh, Ward Councillor May Haynes, who apologises make it here today. And she writes, Chairman, Planning Board members, the main concerns expressed by many neighbouring residents at Kingsgate to the west of the site is the impact of the roof terrace from noise and overlooking perceived and real. With the current dwelling, there is no usable raised outside area, some noise from occupants using the outside space. It is mitigated by being on ground level with no issues of overlooking. Residents in Kingate on the um, with um, windows facing east onto the proposed terrace level feel that they will be overlooking and any noise would be heard much clearer. This area will be level with the building and anyone using it. It will be able to look directly into the living rooms and bedrooms of the flat directly facing Similar concerns have also been expressed by the neighbouring block at 5 Avenue, Christchurch, west east of, to the east of the site. Uh, also, concerns with overlooking into their outside emergency space that is used by their parishioners. Policy PP27, small bracket C, as the proposed roof terrace is not compatible with surrounding uses, or it results in harmful and amenity for both local residents and future occupiers on and noise nuisance to neighbouring residents. PP27 bracket C states that proposals should be compatible with surrounding uses and would not result in impact upon amenity for both local residents and future occupiers considering levels of sunlight, sea, noise and vibration emissions, artificial light intrusion and whether the <coughs> is overbearing or oppressive. This terrace will impact on the occupants of Kingsgate will also be and there will also be mutual overlooking issues for the occupants and future occupants of this proposal site. As the terrace is designed to be an integral part of the proposal, that includes additional usable space outside space consideration needs to be given to their future occupants. Chairman, this proposal is therefore contrary to Seven bracket C and as such should be refused. If, however, the board were minded to grant, I would ask that a condition requiring obscure glass balustrading be installed on the west and east side gate against overlooking concerns by neighbouring residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Members, is there anyone that would like to kick off on this one? I think we need to bear in mind that they do have an extant permission and wisdom from using that. I think we do have to just realise that they do have that there and they have been granted permission for a larger building than what is on the site at the moment. Actually, just a question. Uh, the east side um, does appear that there is a degree of overlooking uh, to the patio and ground floor area of the church hall. I wonder if I could just have the officer's view on that. Yeah. Mr Hodges. Uh, thank you, Chair. So if I, just, um, if I just show you the floor plans here, um, in terms of those uh, windows, um, you see there's a bedroom in here. Um, uh, this other window serves an ensuite. There's a bedroom here. Um, in terms of um, just to just to draw a comparison, of, say a bedroom window has been approved on the previous scheme in that location as well. Um, so in effect, there will be limited difference on the fallback position. And just um, to take you to the, let's say this existing um, scenario where you do have this terrace here, you've got patio doors up onto this area, and this is the uh, uh, the church hall on the right here. So um, in effect, the difference would be being at that level against uh, perhaps being at um, 
this uh, ease level here, I think in terms of overall change um, on that score. But um, in effect, those that very tight relationship already exists, Chairman. Um, yeah, yeah I, it's, it's not the, uh, the windows that I was concerned with, it, but there was the concern over the uh, ground floor around the hall. And obviously, if you're looking at the greater height and the terrace, you're looking directly down onto the amenity space all the people using the hall. Um, and and I think the suggestion that um, some kind of a paint screen to the east side of Roof Terrace has got um, because that would address those concerns. Mr. Uh, yeah. Yes, Chairman, just, just drawing your attention to um, uh, the, the approved plan. So the approved plan does uh, include this terrace area here, um, which is on the side. Um, closest to the uh, church hall on this eastern side. So this is the eastern elevation here. Um, so the the only difference is, is there's a, a larger area um, available here. In, in, um, but in terms of that broad principle, um, the applicant has a fallback position to uh, have a terrace in this location there already. Yeah, and with regards to the opaque glass for the balcony? In, in terms of a privacy screen, Chairman, I, I don't know if I yeah. picked up um, that uh, question. Uh, let me just get to the east side. Yeah, Councillor Haynes in her statement says that if it were granted, could a condition be added that the um, screen was opaque? Um, yes, yes, if members were sufficiently concerned. Um, just to uh, try and give you some uh, levels of the um, as I as I read the plan, your your sort of floor level is along what would be the eaves level of the current dwelling here. You can see that sort of dotted the hip roof um, as is. Um, so if members were sufficiently concerned, um, but uh, as I say, my understanding is your views would all uh, be limited um, in any case um, by the design of this sort of parapet uh, here. Um, uh, which would restrict the amount of views that you would have, um, particularly uh, anyone who was uh, sat down on that on that terrace there. Um, so this is going to be at roof height and the parapet is only slightly below there uh, at that height there, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hodges. Councillor Um Do I understand the concerns of neighbours and, and people are always worried about change. I don't really have any concerns about the adjacent uh, area of the hall because yes it is an immediate space presumably it would be used by a number of people at any one time they were somebody walking by on the footpath observing them i can't see there would be any problem with casual observance from this window or balcony or wherever else around and in fact most of us could look out of one of our windows, bedroom windows, and we could, if we wish, look down into our neighbours' guns and properties. And you might do that briefly, but it doesn't happen for a long time. Um, if you really want to see what the neighbours are up to, you can go to step, step ladders and look over the fencing, for instance. Uh, I can't see any planning reasons, though I do see the point of all the screening, Juliet balconies and around the um, proposed larger area, being obscure glazed because yes, while somebody could stand and look over it briefly, if they so wished, they happen to be sitting there for a long time, then they don't have long casual observance of anything down below them. They would have sky level and above, uh, which should be free for anybody to watch. And I think obscure would solve the problems uh, perceived whether they're real or, or just perceived uh, of the see any planning reason to refuse it so i'm perfectly happy to uh, suggest approval subject to screening of all all mountains obscure screening of all mountains 
Thank you, Councillor Stribley. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. No, I happily second that move from Councillor Stribley with that added condition uh, regarding Juliet Balkins. I think that, but that should be obscured ways because, as Councillor Stribley said, it prevents you from lying down in your bed at the other end of the room and casually gazing out over everyone you can see. Um, with regards to the overlooking from the terrace, um, I, I don't really have very many concerns. I think that the water, the fact that the uh, boundary of the east is a wall and not a, a, a screen, I think provides more than enough uh, protection against any overlooking there because not only is it obviously more opaque than even opaque glass, it'll also be thicker, which means that you can just stand and, and, and look over it and peer down. Um, and with regards to the other buildings around, the fact that the distance is well over 30 metres, I don't think in panic terms that there's anything that we can stand on there to, to reject it from an overlooking point of view. So, like I say, I will. Happily second Councillor Stribley's move. I don't think there's any kind of reasons to it. Councillor Johnson. Uh, Councillor Barnes. Yeah, thank you. To clarify what the height of the, um, the uh, terrorist uh, screen is. It looks like it's a waste of screen, but you could just. I'll just could you confirm that, please? Um, you'll have to give me uh, a minute to try and do that. Uh, if you if that's okay yeah absolutely yes um, you know there's something distinctly between looking from the terrace as opposed to looking uh through the bedroom window a bedroom window you know and the terrace is built so you can look out and see everything around you and equally you expect that people can look up at you uh if the terrace were used um a lot and as you say what's going to be then they will be able to look down directly onto the amenity space of the church. The only concern I have with this, and it could, it could that, that, that could be mitigated by putting a screen on the east side. Uh, I don't have the same concern about the uh, block of flats because of the distance away. It is a good distance away, whereas the church is adjacent, right on the, on the eastern boundary, and that's the only, the, and that's something that's been picked up by both the, both the, uh, the, church, the church itself and by Councillor Haynes as well in, in, in her deputation. So, you know, I, I don't think it's an unreasonable uh, thing, that, you know, and it could be conditioned uh, and it would provide the level of privacy that, that uh, the church is seeking. Thank you, Councillor Barton. I'll just wait for Mr. Rogers to come back in the meantime. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about the amenity space of the church hall. Uh, for my own purpose, can you clarify the occupation of that amenity space? Is it casual church goers and casual, or is it in constant use? We'll just wait for Mr. Hodges to come back and catch right now. Any answer that for us? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Just coming back on Councillor Barton's point, I think that he's right in that, that the east side is the most um, the most overlooked and the one I have most concerns about, as did Councillor Stripley. But um, if members were worried about that, I think that rather than put an obscure, an obscure, given that it's already a wall on that side, it might make sense to raise the height of that wall slightly if, if the members were minded to. I'm not personally, I think it'll be okay. But I think that putting a, an obscure glazing screen on top of a wall um, that what is also <laughs> going to be near head height might look a bit might look a bit silly. I think I think that's a, I think the applicant might have something to say about that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Barton, I'll just yeah, thank you for for that. Having measured it um, on the uh, the website, so I make the height from this position at the existing ease level up to the top here at 1.4 meters. So if you were concerned about uh, that, um, as I say, uh, the issue would be. Uh, in terms of raising that, in that that's a that's like it's different to what you've got in terms of uh, the plan before you. 
Um, because um, what I'm slightly concerned about is if we now say this parapet needs to be 1.6, 1.8, um, that's a materially different plan. Um, and I'm slightly uncomfortable about whether we can just deal with that as a condition, because in effect, that's just um, raising the height up to approximately this height of the flat roof. So I've just got a question mark about the reasonableness of, in effect, redesigning the scheme um, through a planning condition um, and uh, the whether that meets the meets the reasonable tests. Um, so I think the, the short answer is uh, because of that height, someone who stood up potentially had a view over that. Um, the thing, thing you need to consider is the extent to how that's different from this existing plan, um, excuse me, which allows uh, someone to come out on here, stand on here, and say they've got a much clearer view. Uh, anyone who sat down or stood up on this existing approved terrace in this area here, um, and also as you see from the existing photos, uh, the existing terrace that uh, already exists at the at the property. So. Um, Need to consider the reasonableness of, of that and uh, from I suspect actually raising that up to 1.6, 1.8 uh, would require uh, fresh plans, potentially a reconsultation with, with neighbours and, and potentially looking at a deferral <coughs> from this meeting, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. And with regards to the usage of amenity area for the church, a question that Councillor O'Neill asked, do we know whether that's permanent or whether it's just ad, ad hoc? Yes, no, it's, it's unclear. I mean, the, the representations from the church, as I understand it, um, indicate that they do use that area and, and uh, that's to be expected. Of course, that's in relation to their lawful use of the site um, uh, for religious purposes. So, and, and their ancillary purposes in terms of the use of the in terms of the use of the church hall. And um, the the representations from the church don't indicate um, a nature or extent of usage, but it would presumably be ancillary to their lawful use of um, of the church hall. And um, uh, beyond that, um, I'm not sure I can offer any further comment on that, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Councillor Barber. Yeah, I, I, I understand the officer's position on that entirely. Given the excellent approval, I wouldn't want to hold uh, or object to, uh, to this application. I think there's a point where well, yeah, it was good to get the clarity of the answer on that one. Uh, Councillor Hilliard. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, so I'm concerned with the uh, loss of amenity overlooking for the north boundary. So. Whilst the glass to glass separation is 30 metres, we have heard that there's obviously garden patio space which would be overlooked, and there's no getting away from that. Uh, I think the officer mentioned the previous uh, sample admission has a restriction on the use of the, uh, the, the north side. Could, could he just confirm, please, what that is? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, there's a condition on the um, the previous approval, and it's you may not be able to read it from here, but it's annotated on the plan um, that this area not to be used as a amenity or outdoor space. Um, I think there's partly twofold. Um, one is about um, the, the any sort of risks in terms of overlooking to the north, but also excuse me, in terms of um, potentially that creating a greater pressure to fell those trees on the boundary. So if, if, that's a, if that's a terrace or open area whereby it receives a lot of leaf litter or is overhung by the trees, it might end up with a greater pressure to fell the trees. So um, bearing in mind the scheme also approves a, a very attractive south terrace, it would, uh, seems uh, not unreasonable to restrict use of that. And just to clarify, um, this current proposal uh, also proposes to, in effect, uh, fence off, screen off this uh, corner here for similar reasons. Um, and this is also annotated as showing that um, uh, the area is not to be used um, for uh, sitting out or uh, uh, an amenity and ancillary amenity space for the applicant. Thank you for clarifying that. So obviously at the moment, so there is that overlooking, there is nothing at the north end, the exam Exam permission specifically refers to stop overviewing on the north. 
so I, I, I can't support it. I, I think there is a threat of overlooking to the rear gardens patio. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hillier. Any further comments from members, please? Councillor Le Pen. Thank you. I'm just blowing up the, the, the plans on, on my screen and looking at the relation between Kingsgate House and the church and the intervening area. The non built area is minute looking at this which I assume is the area they're referring to as the amenity area, it doesn't look as though it could be used for much activity at all. I mean, it doesn't look as if it's big enough for, for instance, children's party games or you know, anything like that. So I, I don't know what they might be referring to in terms of, of the use of it, but I can't imagine there's anything much going on there that would be <laughs> worth looking at, shall we say. Any comments, Mr. Hodges? Uh, no, nothing further to add on that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. All questions asked? A move. We have a move by Councillor Scribley and seconded by Councillor Johnson to accept the recommendations along with the opaque glass. Is the mover and seconder happy with the opaque glass being added as a condition? That's yeah. what we've proposed, Jim. Thank you very much. In that case, again, I will call names one at a time, and if you could answer for or against, please. Councillor Barron. For. Councillor Bartlett. For. Councillor Bull. For. Councillor Davies. For. Councillor Dion. For. Councillor Farquhar. For. Councillor Hall. For. Councillor Hilliard. Against. Councillor Le Pedivin. For. Councillor McCormick. For. Councillor O'Neill. For. Uh, Councillor Stribley. For. Uh, Councillor Johnson. For. And myself, Councillor Kelsey, also for. Uh, that is, in my estimation, 13 for and one against. Correct. Correct. Yes, Therefore, that application has been granted with the condition added regarding the obscure blazing. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much to the members of the public for coming along and for all those that have written in with their objections and taken part in the planning process. That being the final application for the afternoon. Yes, madam. I just wonder if the committee members could confirm that they actually read the information provided by the Kingsgate Block Flats. Unfortunately, our statement wasn't read out, and um, from the questioning that has taken place today, there is no indication that anyone has had any query on any of the points raised by Kingsgate. If it was sent around as an email to all members, I'm sure, like myself, we get hundreds of emails regarding each application. If it's an application we're dealing with that day, then we will try to make sure that we read them to take any note of them. I know you didn't get a chance to read it out, but we do take note of all application letters that we get from all local residents. Thank you. So I now declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much, everyone. See you next time.